We're going to talk about two things today, one being perfection and the other being letting go. So we'll see if I get to letting go. But uh, approaching the third division of my life, I have discovered that I am now joining things, something I never did in the first two-thirds of my life never was much of a joiner. <clears throat> and uh, so I joined this organization for people that make musical instruments, mostly because I wanted to get their journal, but also it was very tantalizing the idea of being able to network with people that did this thing since I've, for the first two thirds of my life, done almost everything in total isolation. Um, and I read a very interesting article this morning because I got my little tiny certificate that I'll have to put a lot of matting around so that it's big enough to go on a frame. <laughs> Advertised, with joining you get certificate. Yes, could put in wallet certificate. But um, they publish a few things, and they publish a, a book on historical loot making, which is a fascinating thing, which probably will never, I will never get drawn into historical loot making because I'd have a hard time making something I couldn't play. And I'm not really sure that at this juncture in my life I want to attempt to learn how to play an instrument that has 20 strings. And um, so probably won't do that. Might buy the book just because it would be neat to have. And uh, a fellow in the letters to the editor part of this talked about how much he enjoyed getting this book. He got the book and he saw it and he had planned this summer, must be a person that works for a living, planned this summer to begin making one of these lutes. And he found it very refreshing that uh, the author of this book, um, and this book has just been, everybody's just said it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. Uh, because he brings so many things together with this, the lute, which is a complicated instrument to make because it has a multiple piece back and you know and curves and this and that. And, um, <clears throat> he said he felt so refreshed that the author talked about what was good enough. And I've kind of taken this attitude the last few years working with young people because young people never even approach good enough. Young people don't even get started and they say, oh, well, that's good enough. And so I've made it kind of a motto that good enough isn't because there was a commercial for something, telephones or water beds or something that said good enough isn't. Here is our perfection. Well, there's been a a, um, an attitude that within the making musical instruments, string musical instruments, that someone, because of this incredible technology we have, with they being able to analyze densities and sound and all these other things, that people could approach true perfection. Even though we generally talk about perfection like we talk about things like heaven, they're ideals. They're not things that we ever really get close to. And what we normally call perfection is usually brilliance. We see something brilliantly made. We see a piece of artwork that captures everything it could possibly capture, so we say it's perfect. It moves us in such a way that nothing else could move us. But the notion of perfection that no mistake has been made that nothing could be improved upon um, is an interesting idea. And some people live their life trying to reach that point. And yet, by definition, that point would be the end. That's where you'd be where you'd be finished. That if you truly reach perfection, then you could just stop because nothing ever could be done any better. So there's no point in going on. So <clears throat> I think in artistic endeavors, the idea of perfection may be there, but it's always something that's strived for. And it's a very positive kind of striving because it allows you to experiment with things, do things differently, make mistakes, correct mistakes, and do some brilliant work. So 
this guy in his article said, it is so, so great to read someone who is, as accomplished as this loot maker is talk about what's good enough. If you're able to do this and it comes together in this manner, then this is good enough. And now you can do this and this and this. And uh, I have become conscious of the fact that instrument makers have been toying with this idea that the perfect guitar, let's say, has absolutely no fault. Nobody ever made a mistake anywhere on it. And I find myself, of course, with a critical eye in the last few years kind of sort of moving towards doing this kind of stuff again. <clears throat> I'm certainly critical with myself. And I find myself critical with other works because of things, things can always be done better than they are. <clears throat> so an interesting idea to juggle, the idea of, of what's good enough. If we have that big drip of paint that's run all the way down the wall, do we accept that as good enough or do we get some sandpaper after it's cured for about a week and do we sand it off and touch it up? Probably we touch it up. <coughs> because good enough is not about we can make a mess of something and we can just say, okay, that's good enough. But it's about knowing when you get to the point that there's no place you can go beyond. Kind of like accepting your limitations. When I first began practicing the Buddha's teachings, many of my friends <clears throat> were upset because they felt that my interpretation, and of course it was only my interpretation of what I saw, was a very negative thing. In other words, if life's bad, well, okay, just accept it. Roll over and play dead. If you don't get what you want, well, okay, that's karma. If... Uh, I just go on with that ad infinitum. And yet, that was never my interpretation of what the Buddha said. But Buddha kind of said, if you're born without legs, you're not going to be able to ride a bicycle unless you pump with your hands because you don't have any legs, so you accept that. And that's a real natural limitation. That's something you really can't do anything about. You might compensate for it, but you can't do anything about the fact that you don't have any legs. If you're born colorblind, you can't see color doesn't matter how much you want to see color, doesn't matter how much you try, doesn't matter how determined you are, you're not going to change the fact that you can't see color. And the Buddha said with those kinds of things, the only thing you really can do is accept. And so as you move through life, if you were born not the most attractive person in the world, well, there are things you can do to make yourself more attractive, but you're not going to change who you are you're still going to be that person. If you're an average looking person, you're, you certainly can do something with your hair, keep your hygiene up, wear nice clothes, develop a good personality, as the boys like to say. You can do those things, but you don't change who you are, unless you want to do it artificially. And I find it very sad that so many people decide to go under the knife to change what they have, to go under the knife to you know, get a new fanny, get get a tuck here and there, get their face stretched out over their nose so that they look like, it looks like you're looking at a snare drum with a face painted on it. Uh, all of these things that people want to do. Now, I think cosmetic surgery is very useful for people who have been in severe accidents, burn victims, things like that. I think it's wonderful. That's how it all started. Cosmetic surgery started because of wars and because people hurt people so badly. But to go in uh, and get your Botox treatment, you know, get your lips full of collagen, collagen, you know, so they're nice and puffy and look sexy. I'm not sure that uh, that's a good use of time. But we, we always have this idea of perfection, which we have multiple definitions for. It's very, very personal. And this fellow that was talking about this loot he said something that was very, very important. And um, I, I am in no way, as you know, a perfectionist. That isn't what I'm about. Uh, but he talked about the focus had been lost in the luthier's practice, in the making of guitars and other musical instruments, with paying attention to how they played and how they sounded. And 
everything has shifted to how they look. And so when we look to see how skilled a craftsman is, they look to make sure that no glue joints are evident. Everything is perfectly smooth. Everything is just perfection, like a celadon bowl. And have and, and almost forgotten the idea that this is something to be played. This is something that from the moment it starts being played, it starts changing. Uh, fretted instruments always get better when they're played. It, it takes a, a guitar at least a couple years to give it get its full voice because the top of the guitar starts to break down the resins in it. We know this. Even the old, 200 years ago, Ramirez knew this, that this wood would start to break down and the resins would loosen up and you would get the full flexibility and all this kind of thing. And yet, it's like people forgot that. They put cedar tops on because cedar sounds like a seasoned guitar, even though it's somewhat soft and you have to be much more careful with it. Uh, it's very attractive because you can build a guitar that sounds like it's been played for a while. Hmm. <clears throat> but still the focus is in the wrong place. And so it made me think. I have a new guitar that I purchased last year that everybody knows about. And I went and said, I bought a new guitar. First time in forever. And I have a very old guitar. And about the time I got the new guitar, I really looked at the old guitar because I never looked at the guitar. It was recognizable to me, but... I never really looked at it. I was extremely fortunate that I got a professional quality instrument when I was 19 years old. Through no, through no grace of my own, my father decided to go into debt and buy me a guitar, so I had this professional quality instrument. And now I have a brand new professional quality instrument. And of course I looked at it and I, I paid an obscene amount of money for it. And I go back and I look at the old guitar that I've been literally playing all my life. And I realize that the finish is worn through in places. More than one. I notice all the dings that it has acquired in its life. I notice it looks pretty beat up. And yet I've always thought of myself as taking care of this guitar. But it's been played. My father taught me there's a musical instrument has two places it belongs, in its case or in your hands. Any place else it doesn't belong. Of course, my father was a musician. If you don't know that, my father was a musician all his life. <clears throat> and so when my little brother playing in the school band sat on his trumpet, trumpet out on the football field, you know, because this is being cute, this is what kids do, and he bent the horn of it. My father was not real understanding about this bent horn. And years later, I had it straightened where you almost can't tell that this kid sat on this horn. But I got that guitar out last week and just played it one evening, the old guitar, and remembered how well it played. But I was still looking at it and seeing how old it was. And the guitar is as close to you as you can come to perfection. And it doesn't matter that the finish is worn off and it doesn't matter that there's a couple pretty good gouges in the top and it doesn't matter that somebody had a belt buckle on one day when they were pulling it up against them and scratched the back. And it doesn't matter that along the fingerboard where the hand slides, there is no finish. Because that means that guitar was played so much that a hand rubbed off the finish. None of that really matters. And what does matter is probably the action could be reset. It probably needs a couple pieces of new bone. But it's perfection. And the guitar I bought is perfection because it, I can do things with it that I can't do with any other guitar, including the old guitar, and I'm not even sure why. But when I decided to buy that first guitar, I never really looked at it, because I'm not a perfectionist. I went in and asked to see it, looked at it real quickly, sat down and played it for about half an hour, and would not let go of the guitar. As my friend said, he would not release the guitar. 
the guy wanted to go put it in the case, and he told him to bring the case here, and he would put it in it. <clears throat> so it's, a, it's about this sound business. Now, how do I segue into that? Because I want to share that with you, because perfection is, is really not the two things came together perfectly. Perfection is, does it work? People don't understand modern painting, or many people don't. Many people don't like it because it looks like junk to them. It looks like something done by people that can't paint. And here's a big surprise for you. A lot of modern painting is done by people that can't paint, and it is junk. But if you walk into a room and there's an abstract painting set, hanging on the wall, and it evokes in you a response, it does work. That's all the artist is trying to do, is evoke a response. He put the response on the canvas. You recognize it. Whether it fits your definition of what art should be is irrelevant, and the artist will tell you that because art is always changing. It's always growing. It's always being transformed. So if you want to define it and you want to keep it confined, you're in serious trouble because it's not going to happen. Being done cannot be written down in a book because you don't know where to stop. Artists get into trouble sometimes because they don't know when to stop painting. They don't know when it's done. And their friends have to come over and say, you're done. Leave it alone. And artists get into trouble when they're young sometimes because they don't know how much further to go. They think they're done, and yet they're not done. And the work looks very incomplete. And it is. Because they don't know where they want to stop. I want to talk about a... Uh, we're going to topic number two here. I have no way to segue. It's like, I think I'll get this off my mind today. I have a dear friend that uh, got into a little trouble. And I'm reluctant to go into a lot of detail because there is a remote, and it's an extremely remote chance that they would ever go on our website and would ever click this talk that Steve's put on there and would ever listen to it. But I would not want to get too specific. They're going to know I'm talking about them anyway, but they might feel violated if I go into too many details about this thing. So I just want to give you a, a general idea. Because I tried to help, and, and, and I couldn't help. And uh, see, I know when it's done. You do what you can do, and if you can't do any more, you don't take it personally. That's my segue. But um, they worked for many years for an employer, still work for this employer. And every year this employer gives an Employee of the Year Award. Now, uh, these are the kind of things that, one, I never think much about myself, and two, even if I thought about it, um, things like that are nice, but I would, I would never desire it because I've never desired to be like the teacher of the year or something, you know. Not only that, I know that I never would be because just of the way that that, that sort of thing is structured, um, you have to want to be. It's not going to happen if you don't want to be because uh, just the way it, it takes place. But this one friend uh, has worked for over 20 years for the same employer and wanted to be the employee of the year. And more years than not was a contender to be the employee of the year. And um, this year, she was voted the employee of the year. Right? And her boss named someone else because she made an enemy a few years ago. And the enemy said, she will never go anywhere beyond where she's at. And uh, she has a hard time accepting the idea that that wasn't just a limitation on she's not going to go anywhere like a promotion. That's a, that's a limitation on everything. And if you analyze it, it kind of sort of makes a ruthless sense. If you have someone that becomes the employee of the year, how do you deny them a promotion? I mean, if we want to be ruthless about this, and, 
And uh, the people that denied, denied the recognition, they're ruthless. And from a moral standpoint, if you're a moral person, they're not nice. And they're certainly not moral. And um, they take everything very personally, and they get even. And they don't just get even once. They get even over and over and over again. For any imagined slight. So the friend is having a very hard time adjusting to this. Now, Jackie's pretty tough. And Jackie would go, well, you knew this was going to happen. Because, you know, believe it or not, she did. She actually knew that the, the, the bosses at the top uh, had it in for her. These aren't even people she works with. You have to understand. They're not even people she works with. It's accidental if she would actually run into them. But they've decided that they're going to show who's in charge. This is about power. And power becomes more important the higher you get. Uh, I find it incredible that presidents just don't simply go insane with the power. You know, somebody goes in to wake them up one day and they're sitting in the middle of the floor just drooling and, yeah, you know, jabbering and because they're just so powerful that it overwhelms them. But it's about power. So she didn't get it. She's extremely unhappy. She cried for two straight days. She feels it's unjust, which it is. She feels it's not right, which it isn't. She feels it's not moral. It's not moral. She feels it's wrong. It is wrong. She feels it's unfair. It is unfair. It's all of those things, and yet it is her reality. And so now she's decided she's going to fight this thing. She's going to right the wrong. And it makes me think of the school teacher up around Bakersfield who got fired because she made somebody mad. And uh, <clears throat> years ago, this was in the paper, and then she took him to court. It took her 12, 15 years, and she got her job back. By the time she got her job back, she had alienated absolutely everybody in that school district. And when I read that, I thought to myself, why would anybody want to work someplace where nobody liked you? Or they were afraid of you, you know. Some of the people might have been afraid of her because she won. But I can't imagine why I'd want to work someplace that I had to make them take me back. I'm not saying it's right for people to be fired because they don't look a certain way or, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, we, we need equity, but we also need to enjoy where we work. And you're never going to find me working someplace where I forced everybody in that place to have me there because how are they not going to resent me? They're human beings. So my friend is wrestling with the idea of making a really big deal out of this right now. And embarrassing a whole lot of people. And there are, some, there are some bosses between her and these other bosses. And they're going to be in real trouble. Because, of course, they can't control her. And uh, I asked her, I said, what do you want? Remember a couple of weeks ago? What do you want? It's a good question to ask. What do you want? And she said, well, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? All the hurt that comes from having that happen, that doesn't go away. If magically tomorrow somebody stood up, it's kind of like the guy at the Olympics that lost his gold medal and then he got it, you know. How do you remove that event? You don't. So if someone were to come along and say, oops, they misunderstood what we were saying, because I told her, I said, nobody's put anything on writing. You really don't think that anywhere you can find a memo that says, don't let her get any recognition. No, these guys are much, much smarter than that. When you deal in power and your life is about power and control, uh, if, if you haven't learned from Enron, you're pretty stupid and you don't belong there anyway. So there's nothing in writing 
Matter of fact, there may have been nothing said verbally. There may have been a wink, just a wink, just a suggestion of perhaps you might want to look at someone else. Nothing direct. So everybody has deniability. So I said to her, what do you want? What is it you want? Well, I want this all these years. I want the recognition. I said, are you sure? Well, I want them to have to admit, ah, that's what you want. And it ended up being, I want to get even. I want vengeance. They did this to me. They caused all this suffering to me. I've been, she didn't say I've been crying, but she's been absolutely miserable since it happened. And I must tell you, she was miserable before the awards, before the award was given. She was miserable because she anticipated this. And yet, even anticipating it, she went into it and was miserable again. And so what do we do in our practice in a situation like this? Well, the first thing we have to do is find out what we want. Do we want to be miserable? Do we want to be bitter? Because that's what this is about. It's about bitterness and unhappiness, and she already was bitter before this ever happened. She felt that she was limited, which she is. She felt that she's not being allowed to advance within the organization, which she's not. She felt that many people knew this. She's basically blackballed. She was told she was blackballed by more than one person who were in a position to know. Even though that theoretically doesn't happen in the workplace anymore, of course it happens. People in power decide somebody's not going to go anywhere and they don't go anywhere. So the question only is, what do you want? You want to get even? You're, and I asked her, I said, are you ready to retire? Because you think you're unhappy in your job now, when you get done getting even with these people, you won't be able to blow your nose on a Kleenex without somebody looking at you. Just decide what you want. If you want to make a big stink and you, want, you think you're going to get these people in trouble, it's not like they ever broke a law that they could go to jail for. They just are not nice people. Now maybe they did break a law. Maybe somebody could fine them $25. I don't know. But what's a court system going to do about you didn't let the employee of the year who was voted the employee of the year be the employee of the year? I mean, I don't know. I don't have any idea. But I really don't think anybody's going to jail over this. Somebody might get their hand slapped, but since they're all guilty of it, all the big shots, they can go around and slap each other's hands, you know. Okay, don't do that. Or you can now tell me not to do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're talking about these are the guys at the very top. So who's going to slap their hand? We'll slap each other's hand and say, be good from now on. She prayed to God for an answer of what to do after we had talked. Because the, she asked me directly, she said, do you think I just ought to roll over and, and take it? And I said, yeah, unless you're ready to retire. That's all you can do. You just have to accept the fact that all of these times you've been up for this recognition and you didn't get it, there was a message there. So she went and prayed. She didn't get an answer. Because the answer is in her. Simply, does she want to be happy or not? It's not complicated. I look in a woman's magazine. Don't ask why I read women's magazines. I always think they're going to be more interesting than they are. And then there is an article by someone highly religious, which surprised me. Talked a lot about God and stuff. And in this magazine, he talks about letting go. Remember 30, 20, 30 years ago, uh, <clears throat> when the psychological fad was you had to forgive yourself? 
I mean, they cycle through things. You're okay, I'm okay. Men are from Jupiter and women are from Uranus, you know. <laughs> they, keep, they keep cycling for, through all of these different kinds of things. And this one, uh, that, that period of time was, well, you can't, for, you know, you have to forgive yourself. You have to love yourself. And I, I think loving yourself was part of you're okay, I'm okay. But there's, none of these things have ever had anything wrong with them. It's just that everybody gets all focused on one thing, and this is going to be the solution. And so you go out and buy five or six books, and you read them, and you feel good when you're reading the book, and you put it down, and everything's crappy again. So it obviously didn't fix anything, because books don't fix anything. But it is certainly true that if you go around unhappy with people and you hate people, then you can't possibly be really happy. Because if you're angry at people all the time, that is not the definition of happy. Happy's on the other side from anger. So you can't be angry and you can't be contentious and also be happy. You can be one or you can be the other, but you can't be both. So if you're mad at someone your whole life because they didn't let you have a recognition that you feel that you deserve, then you're unhappy. Now, I'm just amazed that anybody will actually set out to be unhappy. But people do it all the time. And you see them all the time. All you have to do is look in their face and you can tell they're not happy. They may be powerful. They may have a whole lot of stuff. They may be able to have great effect on people's lives by simply saying to one of the managers, well, yes, but you might want to look at somebody else for your employee of the year. It has huge impact. I wonder if they really even understand the amount of impact they have on people when they do this. Probably not, and they probably don't care. And if, if you cornered them and got them to admit it, they'd say, well, see, she made a mistake. She crossed me, and I have now shown her how powerful I am. They might not say it that way, but they'd certainly say, well, she's the one that made the mistake. She's the one that stood up to me. She's the one that crossed me, and she did it in public. So, again, it's just what do you want? And if you want to be happy, then you have to let go of that junk. You don't get to hate somebody and be happy simultaneously. Most people don't smile too much when they're in a rage. It's not going to work. And so this article was about letting go, just simply letting go. Except letting go is not easy. So he gave a four-step plan for letting go, which was pretty fanciful, but he gave this four-step plan. And, of course, within that is forgiveness. And then he pointed out, so the, the guy's not totally out of the ballpark, because he pointed out you can forgive somebody and be mad at them a week later, even though you really did forgive them. You know, a week goes by and this stuff kind of festers and it comes back up, so now here we are again confronting it. So he basically said, well, if, if you want to be happy, you've got to let go of your anger and you've got to let go of your need to get even and your need to show them. And you might have to do it a few times. You might have to do it over and over again. You might have to sit on the cushion when you can't concentrate and keep coming back to your meditation over and over and over again because you aren't perfect. You can't just sit down and have the empty mind for endless hours without distraction, you might actually have to figure out what's good enough. And now you can go and restart your meditation again and start all over again and let go of your criticisms of yourself. Because when we stop criticizing ourselves, we can stop criticizing other people. And when we stop being unhappy with ourselves because we're not perfect, we can, we can accept the fact that other people aren't perfect doesn't mean jerks don't exist in the world. doesn't mean there aren't bad people. There aren't people that do hurtful things. There aren't people that you probably would never want to see again. But it means you don't have to be angry with them. And you don't have to get even. And you know, if you need to have some leverage, you can accept the idea that they're not very happy either. And they never will be. They think they are, but they're not. And we have a name for them. We call them hungry ghosts. 
because they can never be satisfied with what they have. And our goal is to not be a hungry ghost, is to be satisfied with what we have. We can make a great effort to have what we have, and that's fine. But once we've figured out when enough is enough, when good enough is it, when this is the best we can do, then we need to learn how to let go and accept ourselves, and accept what we've done and accept other people. Because Buddhism has one very simple goal, to be happy. But you can't be happy if you're always trying to get even and change things. So, it was a good little article. It was one page long. And the part I liked about it is that this guy told all the ladies, well, you might have to do this over and over again. You might forgive somebody because they did something bad to you and a week later find out you're really, really angry. So you might have to just start all over again forgiving them. And we call that the path. Psychologists call it the process that you have to do things over and over again before they become habit. The good news is, if you get in the habit of not holding a grudge, doesn't mean bad things don't stop. It just means you don't react to them. Those bad things don't have the effect sometimes that other people want them to have. Like the person that says a snide remark at the party. My, you know, I used to get criticized because people would say nasty things to me and I wouldn't react. And I'd go, well, maybe they didn't mean that. They meant that. Okay, they meant that. <laughs> but that's okay. That's who they are. They can't do any better. So don't be a reaction all the time. There's a place between cause and effect. It's a very neutral place. It's the cause of the little smile on the Buddha's face. You can go ahead and forgive people for being bad. You can go ahead and forgive yourself for not being perfect. And you can just enjoy every moment.